Well, hello everyone. Dr. Tom here, and um, feels like a long time. Been a couple of weeks since we've been on together. I uh, hope you're out there. Um, as you join in, could you, if you're here, hit a little click, a little hello or something, so I know I'm not just talking to myself. Although I know talking to yourself is, is the best conversation you can have. You know, when we talk about how to, uh, uh, oh, thank you, here we go, thank you so much. Uh, when we talk about how to make changes in your life, the most important conversation that you have to have is with yourself. Hello, Misty <laughs> and Shane, hello. Uh, the most important conversation that you can have is with yourself. So I think you need to be a little bipolar. You know, you need to have a little conversation with yourself and listen to what yourself says about the topic of being healthy. About the, oh, I have to look over here. I've got to remember to look over here. I can't look at myself. I have to look over here. When you want to make a change and you've decided to make a change, now you have to deal with that everyday voice in your head that has to live life, right? That's it. I'm done with wheat. I'm done. And then you're out with your friends and you're hungry. You didn't get lunch and you're, you know, there's nothing available. And what are you going to do, right? What are you going to do? And so sometimes you'll eat the food that's there. And then you'll feel bad, or you actually will feel bad tomorrow if you've been gluten-free for a while and then you expose yourself. Uh, but when you do that, um, it's okay if you hear voices as long as you don't start answering. Well, <laughs> that's uh, from Vasco. Thanks, Vasco. Um, um, I think you have to answer the voices in your head. Not out loud, but you have to answer them and say, thank you for sharing. I hear. I hear what you're saying. Now, where does that come from? And as you process, that's the whole world of psychotherapy, right? Is trying to get a sense of why do I think the way I think? Why do I act the way that I act? And I don't know that you need to go through psychotherapy in this, but you have to listen to that voice. And that voice that's saying, I don't want to. Or maybe I can have a little bit. Or no, you can't. Uh, um, hi, Gabsil, G-A-B-S-Y-L. Gabsil LaWolf, what a great name. Hello, Gabsil. Uh, uh, talking, listening to that voice is important. And then you can't suppress it. My experience has been I can't suppress that voice inside my head, that I have to hear what it has to say and figure out how I'm going to appease that desire of mine, which is not the desire I want necessarily, but it's the desire I've got. I want pizza. That may be the desire. All right, how am I going to satisfy that desire without poisoning my body. If you've learned that you have a sensitivity to weed or to dairy, and you know that it's not something that you should be eating, how are you gonna satisfy that? And you have to have a discussion and kind of make a deal with that voice says, I know you want pizza. Listen, I'm gonna try a salad. I'm gonna put a piece of chicken on it. I'm gonna have it make it a little spicy. I mean, when I order in restaurants, I'll often tell the uh, waiter or waitress, ask the chef to make this a little sassy. And they look at me and say, just ask the chef, see, let's see what he does. You know, I want a little identity. I want a little something new with that food. So uh, I'm going to recommend, hi, Julie, I'm going to recommend that you guys go for more sassy food as you're transitioning, things that are exciting, you know, and that little voice will start to calm down as you find a way around those desires that have been around for a long, long time. So today's topic is gluten blues, and um, it's a huge topic. It's the number one symptom of the brain from a sensitivity to wheat is depression. That's number one, most common. Then brain fog, then anxiety, and then the whole gamut from uh, attention deficit to autism to seizures to... Uh, Parkinson's to Alzheimer's, which may be contributed to by sensitivity to wheat. No, wheat doesn't cause Alzheimer's, but there are a couple of cases. Put them on a gluten-free diet, and this is published in the medical literature. Put them on a gluten-free diet, and there's Alzheimer's starts to dissipate where the patient's brain is functioning better. So I'm going to talk about why that happens. Or seizures. When people have seizures, unrelenting seizures, the... Um, uh, a really common indicator of the likelihood 
that wheat is a problem, uh, a sensitivity to wheat is a problem that's affecting the function of the brain, is if your neurologist does EKGs on the brain and you've got slow or sluggish brainwave patterns. They're just a little slow, they're a little sluggish. The most common symptom associated with that is brain fog. You know, you're just not firing on all eight cylinders. You're firing on three cylinders out of eight or four, uh, but certainly not eight. So if you've had any um, uh, EEGs, if, if you've had electroencephalograms, that's they put wires on your head and they measure the brain waves, uh, if you've had that done, and if you can get the report, take a look and see if it references slow brain wave uh, function. If they do, in whatever language they use, but it sounds like, hello from London, and that would be uh, Virginia, Virgin, Virgin, Virginia, V-I-R-G-I-N-I-J-A, Virginia, hello Virginia, and hello Mary Agnes, so thank you so much. Um, so if you have slow, sluggish brainwave patterns, pretty common to see on an EEG report from a neurologist, and they consider it an incidental finding, it doesn't mean anything to them. Well, it means a whole lot. And what it means is that your brain waves are not firing on all eight cylinders. Now, why might they not be firing on all eight cylinders? You know, I'm a car guy from Detroit, so I use these analogies. What I mean is that your brain's not operating at the level of performance it should normally be operating at. Um, it's operating much more sluggishly than that. And uh, um, so what's the cause? What's the trigger? So if everyone would do this for just a moment, um, if you can, as long as you're not driving, and if you're driving, it's hard to watch this, but can you cross your legs, please? If everyone could cross their legs for just a minute, I'll do it too. Cross your legs. Thank you. Leave them like that for three hours. Now stand up and run. You can't because there's not enough blood flow in your legs. Okay, you can uncross your legs now. There's not enough blood flow in your legs. You can't. So there's a condition that occurs with three out of four people that have a sensitivity to wheat. 73% of the people that have a sensitivity to wheat is called hypoperfusion. Really good scrabble word, hypoperfusion. But what it means is lack of blood flow into the brain. There's not enough blood flow going into the brain. When you don't have enough blood flow going into the brain, it's like crossing your legs. The muscles of your legs can't work very well. Your brain wave patterns become sluggish. That's right, hypoperfusion, Mark. That's correct, hypoperfusion your brain waves become sluggish. The EEGs are just a little slow, a little sluggish, not operating at great potential. If you guys get this, send me a little heart. And if, you know, if I need to talk more about it, I will. So, okay, no hearts, so I'm gonna give you a little more. Mrs. Patient, blood flows up into your brain two ways. You've got the garden hoses coming up your necks on both sides called the carotid arteries. And I do this, not because I'm Italian, but so that you can visualize these garden hoses coming up your neck. Oh, here come the hearts, thank you. At the top of the garden hose, there's a spray, like a lawn sprinkler. And like the lawn sprinkler waters your lawn, the spray from the carotid arteries soaks your brain with blood. Now, I grew up in the Midwest, and in the Midwest, Everybody knows in the summertime, you can't water your lawn for five minutes a day every day. The grass will die because the blades of grass don't absorb water. You have to water the grass long enough to where the water soaks down to the roots. You got to soak it. So you water it for an hour once a week, whatever. But you've got to soak it. You got to get down to the roots. You have to soak your brain with energy or with, with blood. You have to soak your brain with blood. When you don't soak, that's called perfusion. When you don't soak your brain with blood adequately, you have hypoperfusion, low perfusion, low blood flow. It's like crossing your legs for three hours. And whatever part of your brain is not getting enough blood, that's where the symptoms will show. Now, the most common area of the brain 
when you have hypoperfusion, three out of four people sensitivity to weed have hypoperfusion, when the most common area is the frontal lobes. That's our feelings. That's depression, anxiety. That's where our feelings come from is the frontal lobes. For every person, it included the frontal lobes. It may include other areas, like in the back of the brain, the occipital area, that's where seizures come from. Or the sides of the brain, the parietal areas. When you look at the studies of autistic kids, you see that all of the autistic kids that they check, they all have hypoperfusion. They have a lack of blood flow going into the brain, all of them. And those kids that have the same manifestations of autism, maybe it's repetitive behavior, repetitive behavior, repetitive behavior. They keep doing the same thing over and over again. Those kids have one area of the parietal lobes that is hypoperfuse, not getting enough blood flow. Or maybe it's violent behavior, violent behavior, violent behavior. Those kids have a different area where there's a lack of blood flow. And they've all got this area of the brain that's not getting enough blood. That's what's triggering the repetitive symptoms that they get. Just read the science. It becomes clear. It's a lack of blood flow into the brain that contributes to the, the symptoms of autism and seizures and many, many other symptoms of the brain. Well, where does the lack of blood flow in the brain come from? 73% of people with sensitivity to weed have a lack of blood flow in the brain. They've got hypoperfusion. 73%, that's three out of four. Dairy can cause that. Any food sensitivities that you have can cause that. Wheat can cause that. Uh, rice can cause that if you have a sensitivity to rice. Any food sensitivities may cause that. So with that in mind, is that my, is that Lainey? Elena, hi, honey. Oh, that's my, my niece. Hi, honey. It's nice that you're here. Oh, that's really nice. Um, so any sensitivity to food may cause the lack of blood flow going into the brain. It may cause the hypoperfusion. And if you got an EEG, you'd see these sluggish brain waves in there. That, and when you have that lack of blood flow into the brain, whatever area of the brain is affected, and that's determined by your genetic vulnerability and by how you've lived your life. For example, if you've eaten a whole lot of tuna fish and you've been exposed to a whole lot of mercury, and if the microbiota in your gut, the bacteria in your gut and your liver wasn't able to break down the mercury and get rid of it, and it accumulates in your body, it tends to accumulate in the brain. So if mercury accumulates in one part of your brain and you get hypoperfusion, that's the weak link where you, you can get hypoperfusion. You get the symptoms of that part of your brain not working very well. Or if it's in a different part of the brain, because maybe it's lead toxicity that got into your brain, like Flint, Michigan, the water supply, and what's going to happen to all those kids, then a different set of symptoms may occur. And Karen is asking about pins and needles. Can... Um, can that be a symptom of hypoperfusion? Um, any symptom of your nervous system may be caused by brain dysfunction. So pins and needles may be, it's, uh, that's called peripheral neuralgias, pins and needles. That's more commonly a direct association. And the mechanism for that, from a sensitivity to wheat, there are other mechanisms, but from a sensitivity to wheat, is called small fiber neuropathy. These are the people that get pins and needles in their arms and they run the uh, um, uh, uh, EEGs on them, trying to figure out if the nerves are worn down and th the tests are fine. No, the tests are fine, but I've got pins and needles, Doc. It's because it's not the big nerves, which is what these tests check. It's not the big nerves that are affected. It's the small nerves right around the area. And you see pictures of this and you see the celiacs, for example, um, around the area, just under their skin. They call it, um, um, uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, I forget. Uh, they take a punch of skin and they look right underneath it and they look at all the nerves in there. And on a celiac, there's less than half the number of nerves in the same area of skin that there is for a person who, same area, they take the skin from them and look underneath it as uh, the small fiber neuropathy. And what they find is that the celiacs have about half of the nerves left. It's an autoimmune mechanism that's been killing the nerves. But that's not today. P pins and needles is different. Today's about the brain. And this is from Monica saying, thank you for what you do. Thanks, Monica. That's really nice. Thank you. 
So depression is the most common symptom. And we know that kids diagnose, hello from uh, Albany, Western Australia. Well, hello, Jill. Thank you so much. Oh, that's really nice. Thank you. We know that children diagnosed with celiac disease have over a three-fold increased risk of committing suicide. Startling statistics. Startling. Startling. And why? Well, it's, it's mostly social phobia. Uh, these kids don't want to go to school because the kids tease them at school. They don't want to go out on Friday night when they're teenagers because they can't go to the pizza parlor with their friends. And so they stay home and they don't want to go to school and they just get in a funk and they've got depression because of the lack of blood flow into the brain and they just get in a funk. Um, uh, it's a, a terrible, terrible situation, which is why we're doing this, you know, why we carry this message out. And here's another from Australia, from Queensland and the Sunshine Coast. Oh, hey, Willie. I lectured there um, four years ago. Beautiful area, the Sunshine Coast. Beautiful area uh, of the world. Um, so wheat sensitivity can cause brain dysfunction of any type. Gluten blues, the depression, is most common. The most common of all of them. Dr. Osborne, nice to see you, and really thanks so much for joining. Thank you so much. Um, so with, with a gluten sensitivity, the most common mechanism is causing the hypoperfusion, the lack of blood flow into the brain. 73% of celiacs will have that lack of blood flow into the brain. Another mechanism is, is called molecular mimicry. So when your immune system says, I got a problem with wheat, it says that by making antibodies to fight wheat. Those antibodies to fight wheat, oh, by the way, while I'm thinking of it, next week is the first Tuesday of the month, and my director of clinical services, Michelle Ross, will be joining, and we'll be doing the Facebook Live together, and we're going to answer, because there's tons of questions coming in right now, which is really great. And we're going to answer them as best we can when I see them, you know, but I only see two on the screen because I'm using my little iPhone, right? So they just go boom, 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 and I'm missing so many of them. So uh, next week, uh, Michelle and I will be talking more about brain function, and we'll be answering the questions here and talking more about how to test, what are the tests to do, and what are the protocols to follow when you find out what your test results are. So we'll give you a lot more of the dial down stuff. Today, and I want to keep this, if I can, to about 20 minutes or so, if I can, because I promised I would do that, is to give you kind of the big picture overview of this one, because this is so important. Uh, when I'm lecturing, you know, whether it's 50 doctors in a room or 300, the numbers are about the same. I'll, re I'll say, how many of you know or suspect you may have a sensitivity to wheat? Oh, Karen just bought Autoimmune Fix. Thank you, Karen, and thank you for reminding me. I got to do a little plug, everybody. Please get this book. It's a great book, and um, it won the National Book Award, which is really nice. Uh, but it gives you my big picture view about autoimmunity, where it comes from, and a whole bunch of little pearls about what to do, what to do for it. So thanks, Karen, for just buying the book. Uh, um, so I forgot what I was just. Oh, the, the different mechanisms. So your immune system is fighting wheat. It does that by making antibodies to wheat. These are, these are special forces. This isn't just the army that's come out. Antibodies are special forces. They're trained to go after wheat in this example. They're looking for wheat. And so what they look for is the signature of wheat, the protein signature. That means what that protein looks like. And just like a brick wall that's made of a bunch of uh, stone wall that's made of a field stones, lots of different field stones, there can be some patterns that they did when they were uh, uh, building the wall. And so there may be three round and a square, three round and a square, three round and a square. The special forces in your bloodstream is looking for the protein signature that's like three rounds and a square. I refer to it as A, A, B, C, D. When special forces, these antibodies, are going around in the bloodstream looking for A, A, B, C, D, you know, your bloodstream is just a highway. It's just got a whole bunch of traffic on it. There's motorcycles, there's trucks, there's cars, new cars, old cars, little scooters, saw gal on 
a little little moped scooter today on the five on the highway doing 70 miles an hour just holding on. I said, what's wrong with you? You know, that little thing could get blown over. She should be going like 55 in the right lane, but she was hitting it hard. But these antibodies are going after, in the bloodstream, just going after wherever they see the signature of wheat. So I'm going to refer to it as AABCD for this example. When the special forces antibodies are looking for AABCD, now they're going past the thyroid, in my example. Could be the brain, could be anywhere. Let's say it's the thyroid. The surface of your thyroid facing the bloodstream is made up of proteins and fats. The proteins are made up of amino acids. There are hundreds of amino acids long. But it includes AABCD as part of the hundreds of amino acids. So now you've got special forces looking for AABCD and it says, oh, over there. And it fires its chemical bullet at the thyroid. Now you've damaged your thyroid cell. When you damage cells, now your body makes antibodies to get rid of damaged cells. Why is it ever normal to have antibodies to your own cells? Like there's a normal reference range for thyroid antibodies or a normal reference range for myelin antibodies. That's the saran wrap around your nerves. Why is it ever normal to have special forces to your body? It's because, Mrs. Patient, we have a whole new body every seven years. Some cells turn over very quickly. Hello from Barcelona. Oh, very cool. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia, for joining. Thank you. Some cells turn over very quickly, like the inside lining of your gut is every three to five days. It sheds almost like the skin of a snake. Some cells are very slow, like bone cells. Brain, slow, brain cells tend to be a little slower. But every seven years, you have a whole new body. How does that happen? Your immune system has to get rid of the old and damaged thyroid cells. And there's many reasons why our cells get damaged. We won't go into all that now. But the immune system has to get rid of the old and damaged cells to make room for new cells. So there's a normal reference range of antibodies to your thyroid because you're making new thyroid cells every day. Well, now you, those special forces looking for wheat has fired its chemical bullet at the thyroid now you've got extra damaged thyroid cells, more than normal, because your body has to make antibodies to get rid of the damaged cells from special forces attacking. Not a problem, except you have toast for breakfast, special forces, special forces, sandwich for lunch, special forces, special forces, pasta for dinner, special forces, special croutons on your salad, special forces, special cookies, special forces, special forces. This goes on day after day after day after day, and if your genetic weak link is your thyroid, special forces mistakes your thyroid and it attacks your thyroid because it sees A, A, B, C, D. That's called molecular mimicry. Well referenced in the literature, happens to every tissue of your body, wherever your genetic vulnerability is. And when you read this book, you understand that mechanism really, really well. And unfortunately, many doctors don't quite have that understanding down. So they don't know how the sensitivity to a food may cause your autoimmune condition like MS or depression or anxiety. They don't know about the science behind the connection between. You now know more, unfortunately, than most of the doctors do. And if you get the book, I'm going to shamelessly plug it once again, when you get the book... Yeah, and you read this, you can actually copy the page and take it to the doctor and say, would you read this, please? Uh, Mary Agnes is saying, not to mention they cut your dish with a bread knife. Okay, okay, yes, okay. Um, and the question from Diane Robertson is, do the blues clear up when you stop, or does it just, and then my phone won't show any more than that? Yes, Diane, yes. Uh, within a day to two days, the hypoperfusion will stop. But the second mechanism that I'm talking about is molecular mimicry. The molecular mimicry mechanism does not stop when you stop eating wheat because you still have the antibodies in your bloodstream. You've got this assembly line making antibodies, making antibodies. So you stop eating wheat, you don't need them anymore. So the general that's telling the direction of what to do for your immune system, the general says, Okay, and he's scouting all the time. 
it takes a while. It takes about four to eight weeks before the general turns off the assembly line so that you stop making the antibodies. So you keep making, thanks Adam. Adam just gave me a high five. He says, that's right. Excellent point. Thank you. The, the, the immune system keeps making the antibodies for four to eight weeks after you stop eating the food. So if the mechanism of your gluten blues is inflammation in the front part of your brain from molecular mimicry from the antibodies, it won't go away in a couple of days. It'll take a couple of months. But if the inflammation is, uh, is triggered because of the hypoperfusion, that goes away in a few days because that's not antibody based. So it just depends. So what do you do? You do the right tests so that you see on paper, oh darn, I guess I really do have this problem. And when you do the right tests, and then that's the motivation to follow through, whether you feel bad when you eat wheat or not, I don't give a hoot if you feel bad when you eat wheat. You have elevated antibodies to wheat, your immune system is saying, we got a problem here. And ignoring the problem will trigger, as you will learn in, oh, this wonderful book, The Autoimmune Fix, available on Amazon and in your local bookstore. <laughs> um, when you learn this mechanism, you see that it can take like two days for the gluten blues to go away, or it might, you might transition slowly. It, it might take two months. It might take two months. Uh, oh, hi, Laura. Oh, thanks. Thanks for being here. So um, there's another component to this, and that is there are many different uh, pieces of wheat that gets poorly digested. You know, the problem is no human has the enzymes to break down wheat completely. We break it into clumps of proteins called peptides. And the problem is that some of these clumps of proteins of, uh, that are called peptides, your immune system makes antibodies to them. Now, when you do the right test, if it comes back, and if you have elevated antibodies to the clumps of the proteins of poorly digested wheat, called gluteomorphins or prodynorphins, these are compounds that bind onto your opiate receptors, like opium or like these uh, opiate drugs that's a big um, addiction problem right now, or like marijuana, uh, or like nicotine stimulates the opiate receptors. And so people say, oh, I don't need wheat, I just like it. Well, hello. But if you have those elevated antibodies, gluteomorphins and prodynorphins, when you do the right test, those are the ones that are elevated, you're going to have a little harder time. There's going to be a little bit of a withdrawal. And there's a whole protocol to follow to accommodate um, that withdrawal process. Uh, one of the things is eat spicy foods um, that at the threshold that you can handle because spicy foods stimulate your opiate receptors. So you get a healthier buzz, if you will, and you don't need to get it from wheat, which um, um, is not bad for you to, that you get the buzz from it. But the other problems with wheat are what cause you problems. So... Uh, you want to avoid wheat. If you have elevated antibodies, you have to get it out of there. No matter what, you got to get it out of there. So the two mechanisms that I've talked about are what I, sus I suspect, are, uh, there's never been a study that's identified which mechanism is most prominent. Uh, that, well, that's not true. Hypoperfusion is most prominent. But after that, there are a number of different mechanisms by which a sensitivity to wheat can cause problems. The second most common one is molecular mimicry, AABCD. Um, the third most common one that I've seen in clinical practice is if you have the elevated antibodies to gluteomorphins or prodynorphins, when you don't eat wheat, you can just crash. Um, you, you, you can go into a depression. And so for those people, we are, uh, oh, Adam's gotta go, working very early tomorrow morning. All right, Adam, thanks so much. Thanks for being here and for all of you that are here. So for those people, we recommend a transition that you, say, you know what, I'm just not going to have wheat for breakfast three days a week, every other day. And then as you learn breakfast that you like, it takes you a couple of weeks maybe, and you find breakfast that you like that don't have any wheat in them, they say, okay, I'm done with wheat at breakfast. You know what, I'm not going to have wheat for lunch twice a week. 
and you learn to order salads with a piece of chicken on it or soups and you ask to make sure they're gluten-free soups or whatever, but you just transition slowly. You don't have to stop right now. It's always better if you can, but if you've got gluteomorphins and prodynorphins, don't try that. Transition. Just transition slowly. Okay, and um, uh, uh, Michaela is saying, uh, hi, Tom, I tease Glenn. I still know Crohn since I quit, I think, wheat. Um, the message just stopped, but congratulations. So I'm going to sign off now because I'm trying to keep this uh, not too long and people are going to sleep. Very kind of you, Adam, to say good night. Thank you. Good night to you. And uh, be careful out there, folks. It's Halloween and, um, you know, a little bit of candy is not good for you. It's still sugar. Uh, Karen's asking about sourdough. If it's wheat, it's wheat. And it doesn't matter that it's sourdough. If it's ancient wheat, it's wheat. Once you make antibodies to the proteins, your immune system can't be fooled by that. Um, so, um, and we'll answer all the questions. Michelle and I will answer all the questions next week. We're going to do this and we're going to talk a lot more about protocols and what to do. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Bless you. Thanks for all the little smileys. It makes my day to see that. It... Um, uh, and it's you guys with your feedback that make it worthwhile. Please like the Facebook page. I'm told that's important, so they remind me to do that. So please like that. And, of course, this is the Bible. Please get the book. Okay, thank you very much, and happy evening to you. Bye-bye.